Lord Paladin Tyrion Fordring was currently making his way through the tranquil Hearthglen woods atop his stallion, Mirador. This was his happy place. He absolutely loved coming here to hunt, to be alone with his thoughts in the crisp country air, rather than being confined inside his keep doing paperwork and having brain trust meetings. Unfortunately, opportunities to get out here and hunt were few and far between these days, now that he was in his fifties and the governor of Hearthglen. He wasn't a bad governor. The people respected him. His name and deeds were honoured throughout the entire kingdom of Lordaeron. His keep, Mardenhold, was a centre of bustling commerce and trade for the surrounding region. The citizens of Hearthglen took great pride in the fact that Mardenhold's walls had never fallen to invaders, not even during the darkest days of the Second War. But in recent weeks, Tyrion's keep had become a little bit overrun by travelling dignitaries and representatives from the various nations of the Alliance, all passing through on their super-secret and important diplomatic errands. The Lord Paladin had noticed a sense of growing tension among all of them, and suspected they were each carrying dire news for the ears of the Alliance High Council. They were certainly tight-lipped, not sharing any details with him personally, but Tyrion was no fool. He'd served the Alliance for thirty years. Only one thing could cause emissaries to be this bloody nervous. War was returning to Lordaeron. It had been nearly twelve years since the last one against the Orcish Horde had ended. A lot of people died, a lot of kingdoms fell. Tyrion had lost a number of good friends himself. The Alliance had rallied at the eleventh hour and somehow pulled a victory out of their ass, but it came with a heavy price. Almost an entire generation of young men had given their lives to ensure mankind would never be slaves to savage overlords. After the war, the battered and leaderless orc clans had been rounded up, placed in internment camps. As a precautionary measure, each camp was policed by entire regiments of knights and footmen, but for some strange unknown reason, the orcs had become quite docile as time had passed. No longer raging with bloodlust, they all seemed to have gone into some strange communal stupor. A lot of theories floated about over this. Was it because of inactivity? Lack of exercise? Were they not getting enough carbohydrates? But Tyrion didn't give a shit. He'd seen their brutality first hand. Absolutely nothing was going to convince him that the orcs had changed. As far as he was concerned, they were jerks. The lot of them. Now Tyrion prayed every night the conflict would never endanger his people again. Somewhat naively, considering he's a character in a franchise called Warcraft, but he doesn't know that. He had a young son to worry about. The last thing he wanted for Talon was for the little bastard to witness or experience the horrors of war, because there were far too many kids in this world that already had. Far too many orphans that were now cold and disassociated with everything. Certainly not something he wanted for his own boy. If the orcs were foolish enough to rise up again, Tyrion was willing to do whatever it takes to stop them. It was his duty. He may not have been born a noble, but his honour and enthusiasm had earned him the rank of knight at the tender age of 18. He'd served as a knight with undying loyalty to his king, which in turn gained him the honour of standing with Uther the Lightbringer, being anointed one of the first paladins. Handpicked he was by Archbishop Alonzo's foul, to become a living vessel of the Holy Light, serving not just as warriors, leading the fight against the vile forces of darkness, but also as healers, curing wounds and diseases and stuff. They'd well and truly turned the tide of the Second War. If it weren't for them, humanity might not have survived. But that's enough exposition. Tyrion pulled on his mount's reins and stopped to get his bearings. He'd wandered a little bit farther than he'd intended to. After graciously thinking about all of that previous five minutes of stuff, so that the audience is up to speed and we can get the story started, he wasn't lost. He knew these woods like the back of his hand. But there were no outposts this far out, at least not manned ones anyway. So he deftly turned Mirador around, and off they went, returning from whence they came. However, as the paladin arrived at an old abandoned guard tower, something caught his eye. Strange tracks. So he jumped off his mount and gave them a little inspection, and very quickly realised that these tracks were not only fresh, but also a bit too big to have been left by a man. Orcs. Hearthglen's borders were secure, and orcs weren't exactly known for their subtlety. There was no way that a group of them could just wander about out here undetected. Yet, these were definitely orc tracks. So, Tyrion unsheathed his sword, moved as stealthily as he could, and entered the tower, and soon enough discovered a small makeshift fire pit, and a ragged patchwork bedroll. Bastards have been squatting, but that was all the evidence Tyrion needed. It was now time to head back to Mardenhold and gather his men. But, as he exited the tower, he immediately found himself face to face with the culprit. The orc seemed just as startled as Tyrion did. He had an axe, which he was currently reaching for, but there was something a little bit different about this orc. 
It had been a while since Tyrion had seen one, but there was an aged weight to its stature, and quite a few wrinkles around its eyes. A seasoned veteran, it seemed. Potentially more dangerous than any orc Tyrion had ever faced before. Fantastic. The two continued to stare at each other for a bit longer, sizing each other up, until eventually Tyrion lunged forward. However, it became apparent pretty quickly that they were evenly matched, in terms of tactics and stamina, so it wasn't long before they both needed a bit of a rest. More staring than occurred, more sizing each other up. Was that a smile on the beast's face, Tyrion wondered? He had to admit, this orc was different than any he'd faced before. Every other orc he'd encountered had rushed forward with reckless abandon, but this one showed finesse and a remarkable amount of self-control. The two then clashed again, attacking and parrying and blocking and all of that sort of thing. But an expertly placed strike then caught the orc off balance, allowing Tyrion to follow up and slash the creature's thigh. The old orc grunted as it slammed down to the ground, but then blinked in astonishment as his human foe backed off. I'm a paladin, a knight of the Silver Hand. Butchering a fallen foe in single combat is unquestionably dishonorable. Tyrion then motioned for the orc to get up and nodded in assurance. So the beast did, and once up on its feet, the creature raised a clenched fist to its heart and did a little chest bump thing. Was that a salute? Tyrion thought. Certainly no savage orc had ever saluted him in battle before. What the bloody hell was going on? For a third time, the two of them surged forward and flailed their arms about at each other for a bit. Only this time, it was the orc that gained the upper hand, forcing Tyrion back inside the tower and slicing the old paladin's arm. Tyrion reacted with a slice of his own, cutting the orc's hand and forcing the beast to drop his axe. But as Tyrion tried to move in and end this duel once and for all, the orc grabbed a wooden beam and swung wildly, and missed. The beam smashed into a rickety wall, and before either of them could do anything about it, the ceiling gave way and collapsed. A short while later, Tyrion woke, surrounded by timber and stone and dust. His body was mostly numb, but he could still feel an immense pressure upon his chest. Great, he was pinned down, and since he'd lost quite a bit of blood from the axe wound in his arm, he wasn't exactly jam-packed full of strength to lift a beam off himself at the moment. He then realised he was actually in quite a lot of pain, so much so he could already feel himself starting to pass out again. And the last thing Tyrion saw before losing consciousness was a pair of very large green menacing hands reaching for him. Meanwhile, in a flashback, a much younger Tyrion Fordring was currently hanging about inside a cathedral, looking proudly towards a stained glass window which depicted an image of a regal warrior. The man, surrounded by a halo of golden light, held a mighty warhammer in one hand and a large tome in the other. And the inscription on that tome read Isaras Tharno Darador, which translates to, by blood and honour we serve. The young knight then knelt down and bowed his head in prayer. To the left of him stood a group of men in white robes, clerics, warrior priests from Northshire, and to his right, another group stood, dressed in heavy suits of armour, the Knights of the Silver Hand. Directly in front of Tyrion, standing at an altar, was another robed man. In the light, we gather to empower our brother. In its grace, he will be made anew. In its power, he shall educate the masses. In its strength, he shall combat the shadow. And in its wisdom, he shall lead his brethren to the eternal rewards of paradise. The Archbishop then closed the book he was holding, whilst Tyrion felt a rush of excitement sweep through his entire body. Clerics of the Northshire, if you deem this man worthy, place your blessings upon him. One of the priests stepped forward, approached Tyrion and placed one of those decorative Christian scarf things around his neck. He then placed his thumb in a vial of sacred oil and booped the young knight right on the forehead with it. By the grace of the light, may your brethren be healed. And with that, the cleric bowed and backed up, standing back once more among his fellows. Knights of the Silver Hand, if you deem this man worthy, place your blessings upon him. Two paladins stepped forward, making no effort to hide the obvious pride on their faces. One of them then placed an exceptionally crafted warhammer at Tyrion's feet, whilst the other dropped some heavy silver plates upon the young knight's shoulders. By the strength of the light, may your enemies be undone. That second paladin, one Sadan Dathrahan, then shot Tyrion a quick wink, who smiled in return knowingly, and the two of them then backed up and returned to their group. Do you, Tyrion Fordring, vow to uphold the honouring codes of the Order of the Silver Hand? I do. Do you vow to walk in the grace of the light, and spread its wisdom to your fellow man? I do. Do you vow to vanquish evil, wherever it be found, and protect the weak and innocent with your very life? By my blood and honour, I do. Brothers, you who have gathered here to bear witness, raise your hands and let the light illuminate this man. 
Both groups at Tyrion's flanks raised their hands, and Tyrion watched in amazement as a soft golden radiance began emanating. The light then enveloped him, sending life-giving energies through his entire being, energies that could heal any wound or cure any disease. It was glorious. Arise, Tyrion Fordring. Welcome to the Order of the Silver Hand. Boo! Tyrion woke with a start, and was ever so slightly confused to find himself lying in a bed, with the sound of children's frolicking coming through a nearby window, as well as the familiar hustle and bustle sounds of everyday life within the grounds of Mardenhold Keep. How the hell did he get here? As his groggy mind started to clear, he then realised he was lying on sheets soaked with sweat that smelled kind of nasty. How long had he been asleep? What the bloody hell was going on? Tyrion then tried to recall the events that had led to this moment, but due to the incessant pounding in his head, it was all a bit blurry. He remembered the dream he was just having. Bunch of robed people. Bunch of armoured people. An orc. Wait, an orc? That certainly wasn't an orc at his initiation ceremony. A few more images then flashed in his mind, which helped to make things a little bit clearer. There was a fight between him and an orc, and he'd lost. Nah, what a load of nonsense. Thank the light, you're awake. Tyrion's wife Carandra rushed over to him. I was beginning to wonder if you were going to sleep clear through mid-year. How long have I slept? Nearly four days. Four? I don't even know what happened. I'm not exactly sure either. You left in the morning to go hunting, but you were late returning. I got worried, so I sent Arden out to find you. He barely made it outside the keep before he found you atop Mirador. Unconscious. Tied to the saddle with your own reins. Tied to my saddle. That doesn't make any sense. Your ribs were broken, Tyrion. And your arm had been sliced clear open. Tyrion, whilst you slept, you cried out a number of times in delirium. About orcs, my love. You said that there were orcs in Hearthclay. At that moment, memories of the previous encounter came flooding back to Tyrion. So he looked his wife deep in the eyes and nodded grimly. I'd save us. However, the door to the room then slammed open, with a five-year-old Talon Fordring bounding inside. Okay. The boy then threw himself at his father. Oh, Talon, my boy. Oh, have you been good for your mother? Another voice boomed through the doorway as a man entered. He's mindful often enough. Just as rambunctious as his father ever was, though. I hope I'm not intruding, my lord. I saw young Talon here rushing this way like a raging ogre. I tried to catch him before he woke you. But I see I need not have worried. Randra tells me I have you to thank for hauling me back to the keep, Arden. If I had a gold mark for every time you fished me out of trouble, I'd... Never mind that. All I did was lead your horse back. If you thank anyone, it should be Bartholus. He just about burned himself out trying to heal you. You've taken quite the beating, my friend. And us all concerned there for a while. I know. There's some things we should discuss immediately, Arden. Tyrion then glanced towards Carandra, who nodded in return. Come on, Talon. It's time for your nap. Me. And then, both the mother and the child buggered off. It was an orc, Arden. And more than likely, it's still alive. Pretty sure it was alone out there, but until we know for sure, I'd like to keep this between us. I don't want to panic the entire province. That might be a problem already, my lord. Bartholus was on hand a few times whilst you slept. He heard you mutter about the orc. As soon as he heard it, he flew into a full rage and started demanding an entire regiment be sent to scour the countryside. Oh, damn it. Now, Bartholus was a young man and had only recently been anointed into the Paladin Order. And although he had been a good student, he had an almost zealous obsession with fighting orcs. Which was understandable, considering his parents were slaughtered by them during the war. I doubt he's been tight-mouthed about my encounter. How many people know, Arden? Rumours have been flying all about the keep for the past few days, sir. Everything from a raiding party to a full-fledged invasion force. People are terrified, Tyrion. The last thing anyone wants is for the Horde to return. Assemble my advisors. We'll continue this discussion in council. Arden saluted and turned to leave, but Tyrion wasn't finished. One last thing. The shape I was in when you found me. Yes, sir. There's no way I could have tied myself to Mirador, is there? No, sir. Not a chance. You saw no one else out there? No, sir. There was no one. I even went back later on to search for tracks. Tyrion nodded and dismissed his lieutenant, and then started to ponder. There were only two people in the woods that morning. Himself and this mysterious orc. Could it possibly be? Thank you, Bartholus. If not for you, I'd have likely gone and joined the light. There's nothing, my lord. I'm sure you'd do the same for me. I wish it had been me facing that orc, though. His head would now be adorning our battlements. 
There were a few raised eyebrows around the room before Bartholus corrected himself. Of course, that's not to say that you couldn't have defeated the beast, my lord. Anyhow, I would prefer that we kept this matter to ourselves for now. I'd rather not rile the citizenry up until we have a better understanding of what we're dealing with. Uh, with respect, are you suggesting we keep silent whilst the enemy creeps unhindered through our lands? We should scour the woods immediately. Every second we waste here could... You're assuming there are more orcs out there, Bartholus. I was there, and I saw none. This is not the time to start jumping at shadows. Jumping at shadows? An orc beats you to a pulp and you want to remain calm? This is madness! A few advisors around the room gasped and started clutching their pearls. But Bartholus continued, undeterred. We should mobilise our hunting party right this instant. And watch your tone with me, boy. Last time I checked, I'm still governor of this province. And your direct superior is a paladin. And for so long as I am, we will do things the way I see fit. You will remain within the keep's grounds until I order you to do otherwise. Is that clear? Are you so shaken by this recent beating that you're too scared to do your duty? Shut up, Bartholus. Stop being a prick. However, Tyrion simply stepped towards the young paladin, looked him dead in the eye, and calmly said, You may leave my council room. Now... It was in that moment that Bartholus realised he'd been a little bit hot-headed, so he calmed himself. Of course, my lord. I'll await your orders eagerly. And then, the young paladin buggered off. I'm sure you will. He's brash, but he's a good man at heart, sir. I'm sure he didn't mean... I know what he is, and I know what he meant. He's always been ruled by his passions. They're what make him an exceptional paladin, but they're also what make him a liability. But I'm sure he'll come around once he's calmed down fully. He always does. But, um, Tyrion, sir, what if he's right? What if there are more orcs out there, ready to strike at us whilst we sit here and do nothing? Under no circumstances do I plan to do nothing, my old friend. I'll be taking care of this matter myself. The following morning, Tyrion got up, quietly, so as to not wake his wife, got himself ready, slapping his armour on and grabbing his warhammer and stuff, then made his way to the stables to grab his trusty steed. As he'd said in the last chapter, he had no intention of sitting around doing nothing. It was time to take care of business. What are you doing? I'm going to investigate the tower's ruins, Arden. If the orcs plan an invasion of my land, I'll find proof of it myself. Great. Then I'll settle up and go with you. I don't wish to have company. This is something I must do alone, my friend. I don't think that's such a good idea, Tyrion. What are you trying to prove? Heading off unescorted so soon after you... My what, Arden? My defeat? Arden then looked at the floor and shifted uncomfortably. I'll be back in a few hours. Just try to keep an eye on Bartholus while I'm gone. I have a feeling he's going to do something stupid. And then, without any more words exchanged, the Lord Paladin spurred his horse and buggered off. After a few hours, Tyrion arrived at the ruined tower where he'd fought the orcs several days earlier. He knew it wasn't the smartest move, approaching an enemy's encampment without any backup whatsoever, but he just had a feeling, some gut instinct, that this orc was alone and there was nothing to worry about. Oh. Tyrion turned to see the aforementioned orc sat on a nearby rock. The creature seemed calm and poised, but its axe lay within easy reach, just in case. However, rather than shitting himself and grabbing his hammer, Tyrion took a few steps towards the beast and did a little chest bump thing. And to his amazement, the orc raised a stiff hand to its brow in return. This is how you humans do it, is it not? Bloody hell. It speaks understandable words. What? Did you think my people survived this long in your world using brute strength alone? Your kind has always underestimated us. That's why you lost the first war, I think. Tyrion just kind of stood there, absolutely dumbfounded for a few more seconds until finally... I must now. Did you pull me from the tower and lead my horse back to the road? Yes. Why? Why would you do that? The orc considered this for a moment, and then responded. You have great honour for a human. That much was clear from our fight. And no honourable warrior deserves to die like a trapped animal. It wouldn't have been right to just leave you there. Besides, I've seen enough death already. Tyrion stared, shaking his head. This was mental. His entire worldview was currently being shattered by what was happening right in front of his eyes. As a paladin, he developed a certain empathic ability, allowing him to sense the emotions of others. And whilst his brain wanted to believe that this was a trick, that this orc was full of shit, he could sense that it was being sincere. Well then I suppose I should thank you then. Um, I trick human. 
You may call me Itrig. Well, thank you, Itrig, for saving my life. The orc nodded, and then there was an awkward silence for a moment. I'm, uh, Tyrion Fordring. I should tell you, Itrig, that I'm lord of this land. Your presence here upsets many of the people I'm entrusted to protect. <laughs> I'll wager they slept well enough before you found me. I've lived in these woods for years, human. I made great sport out of evading your scouts. Only reason you found me was bad luck. Perhaps. But your being here still creates a serious problem for me. My people hate your kind, Itrig. Your race brought nothing but misery and chaos. How could I possibly allow you to stay knowing what your people have done? I've abandoned my people, human. I no longer wish to pay for their sins. Why would you disavow your own people? Because they're lost. Now they were lost before they ever even stepped foot on this world. Their honor and their pride left them long ago. But I decided my duty was finished the moment my sons were killed. Your sons warriors. All orcs are warriors, human. We know little else. Despite my son's strength and prowess, they were betrayed by their own leaders. During the last war, my sons were ordered to pull back after a particularly bloody battle. One of our chieftain's rivals, hoping to advance his clan's standing within the Horde, countermanded the order. Sent my sons back to be slaughtered. Again, Tyrion's mind reeled. The fact that orcs fought amongst themselves came as no surprise, but Eitrig's grief certainly did. I realised then there was no hope. Corruption and enmity completely overshadowed my people's spirit. I knew it was only a matter of time before the Horde devoured itself from within. Where did this corruption come from, Eitrig? What drove your people to such depravity? In my grandfather's time, my people were simple and proud. Only a few dozen clans, then. We lived and hunted within the wilds of our world, lived by an honourable code, and worshipped the spirits of the elements themselves. So what happened? A new order rose up, promising to unite the clans and force them into a powerful nation. Many of our shamans abandoned their ancient tradition and began practicing dark magics. Began calling themselves warlocks. Their shadowy powers corrupted the clans and drove them to heinous acts of violence. Under the warlock's rule, the clans were united, I suppose. And only as a rampaging horde. And no one spoke out against them. An entire race of warriors and none of you were willing to fight. There were a few who did not submit. One of the clans led by an orc named Duratan. They challenged the warlocks openly. Tried to convince everyone else. But no one listened. What does it you humans say? Easier to fool people than to convince them they've been fooled. Duratan for his courage was exiled, and then warlock assassins killed him years later. Such is the way of the Horde. <laughs> Look, I'm sorry, Eitrig, but you expect me to believe that your people truly valued honor and yet allowed themselves to be controlled so easily. Have you ever stood against the will of an entire nation, human? Ever questioned an order, knowing that to disobey would mean immediate death? Tyrion looked away. No, he'd never done anything like that. And Idrig nodded, feeling like his point had just been made. It was rumoured that the warlocks consorted with demons, drew upon their infernal powers. And I believe that to be true. The darkness and hatred that took hold of my people could not have been born in our hearts. Well, it seems your people have suffered greatly then, Idrig, even before they roused the wrath of mine. Perhaps I misjudged you. We're much alike, you and I. Those old soldiers who have sacrificed much for our... We're nothing alike, human. I'm a renegade, living as an exile in a hostile land. You're a lord, loved by a free people, able to live as you wish. Fair enough. Our people are at war, Eitrig. So I must ask you, on your honor, are there any other orcs in my land? Does the Horde plan to attack this region? Eitrig sighed, and shook his head. As I've told you already, human, I live here alone. No interest in dealing with others of my kind. I can't tell you what the Horde plans. Only assure you that this old broken warrior has no intention of assaulting your keep or making any trouble for you whatsoever. I just want to be left alone. After a lifetime of fruitless war, peace is the only comfort I have left. Okay then. I accept your words. In return for having saved my life, I will allow you your solitude. So long as you remain hidden, you may stay here. I trick them raised an eyebrow in disbelief. I think perhaps your brethren will hunt me down despite you, human. To them I'm the sum of their fears. Well, I'm their lord, I trick. They'll do as I say. I give you my solemn oath as a light-sworn paladin that your secret will be safe. 
None shall hunt you while I have the power to prevent it. Tyrion didn't feel completely comfortable making that sort of bold statement. It was going to be difficult fulfilling this charge if matters became complicated. Mainly because if anyone ever found out, he'd be branded a traitor. However, his instincts told him this was the right thing to do. All right then. It was nearly dusk by the time Tyrion arrived back at his keep's stables. All he wanted to do was sleep and move on from the day's business. But as he went to enter the keep itself, a hand grabbed his arm quite aggressively. My lord, we must talk immediately. I'm tired, Bartholus. We can talk in the morning. I don't think you understand. You see, I know where you were today. The young paladin's narrow eyes remained fixated on Tyrion for quite a while. Bastard didn't even blink. I know that you know there are orcs in Hearthglen, Tyrion, and I pray for your sake that you're not covering up any pertinent information. I told you before, Bartholus, you will address me with the proper respect. As for your concerns, I've determined that my encounter was an isolated incident. That's all you need to know for the time being. Now take your hand away and let me pass before I lose my temper. Bartholus then slowly released his grip and took a step back, maintaining his intense stare at the Lord Paladin the entire time. But Tyrion didn't give a shit. He just turned his back and walked off. This ain't over. Oh, you're home. Where'd you go running off to this morning? I asked Arden, but he wouldn't tell me anything. Tyrion tensed. He didn't particularly want to lie to his wife. I went out to inspect the site where I fought the Orc, Karandra. I wanted to go alone, so I told Arden not to speak about it with anyone. Karandra frowned. You went off alone only days after your attack. How can you be so reckless, Tyrion? It's not like you're a young man anymore. Tyrion flinched. First Bartholus had pissed him off outside, and now his wife was giving him shit. I've been soldiering for more years than you've been alive, woman. The last thing I need from you is a lecture on how to perform my duties properly. Well, that escalated quickly. Tyrion was obviously butthurt, so Karandra decided a change in tact was probably for the best. Well, did you find what you were looking for? Her change in tone kind of worked, forcing Tyrion to calm down as well. Although he had a suspicion this line of questioning wasn't going to end well either. Yes, I did. I'm convinced that my encounter was an isolated incident. We've nothing to fear from the Orcs. Well, that's good to hear. How can you be so sure, though? Oh, jeez. Here we go. I can't tell you, my love. Why not? It's a matter of honour, Garandra. I can't tell you. Garandra's body language then shifted, and Tyrion half expected lightning bolts to start bursting forth from her eyes. Of course. Honour. It's always honour with you, isn't it? Is your precious honour really so much more important to you than your own wife? Tyrion tried to answer as gently as he could. I wouldn't understand, my love. I'm a paladin. There's a great deal expected of me. There was an uncharacteristic tone of self-pity in his words, and Karanda wanted nothing more than to punch him right in the face. Oh, you're right. I don't understand. But I know exactly what's expected of you. You're expected to act like my husband, and not try to shelter me from your silly little secrets. You're expected to act like a responsible lord, and not go gallivanting off alone, putting yourself in danger. And you're expected to stay alive so that your son doesn't grow up without a father. I know. Please, trust me on this, Karandra. Everything will be all right. Are you too farted? Tyrion turned to see Talon had entered the chat, looking up at the two of them timidly. No, son, we were just discussing orcs. Tyrion had no idea why he'd just told his five-year-old son that, but he was tired and making poor decisions, I guess. Daddy, are the orcs as mean and cruel as everyone says they are? That was a strange question for a five-year-old to ask. Well, son, um, that's hard to answer. I think there are some orcs that can be good. They're just harder to find as well. Karandra then stared at her husband in disbelief. Really? I think sometimes we need to be careful of how quickly we judge people, son. The boy seemed pleased with that answer and skipped off out of the room. And as soon as he was out of earshot, what the fuck is wrong with you, Tyrion? Why would you tell him that? The next few days were pretty uneventful in Hearthglen, which wasn't a bad thing because the rumours and whispers that had been circulating about an imminent horde invasion started to die down. Everybody just sort of went back to normal. Even Karandra, who had seemed pretty pissed off by the end of the last chapter, was now acting quite cheerful and pleasant. So Tyrion was a happy man. After this past week, he'd had his fill of excitement and danger and people giving him shit. However, on this fine sunny morn, as Tyrion watched his wife and child laugh and play and cavort and stuff, the sound of heavy boots clanking loudly filled the air, and then Arden burst into the room, breathing like a maniac. I've been looking all over for you, my lord. We have visitors at the gate. What visitors? 
An envoy from Strathole, sir. Lord Commander Dathrahan is come in person. Escorted by a full regiment. He wishes to speak with you immediately. Tyrion's jaw dropped. Lord Dathrahan and a full regiment showing up unannounced. Tyrion then felt a burst of panic surge through his entire body. He knows about the orc. It was the only explanation. Bartholus, you bloody penis. Well, time to face the music. So Tyrion took a deep breath, steadied himself, gave his family a sidelong glance, and then strode off towards the main gate. Tyrion, my friend, it's good to see you. How long's it been? Four years. Almost four years exactly, my lord. Let's not start with all that, my lord, rubbish. You're one of the few men alive that still remembers me as a snot-nosed whelp. We're on even ground here, you and I. Have it your way, then, Satan. Tyrion had a quick glance over his friend's shoulder and saw row upon row of armoured footmen staring right back at him. Tell me, my friend, why didn't you inform me of your journey? I could have prepared a great feast had I known you were coming. I apologise for the intrusion, Tyrion, but, um, we have urgent business to conduct. I had to come and see you as soon as possible. Is there trouble, Satan? Are we going to war? That's what I'm here to find out. But for now, I'm anxious to meet your lovely bride and son. I regret I couldn't visit and see the lad when he was born. You know how it is. Tyrion nodded. He was fully aware that he had beads of sweat forming on his brow. But all he could do was try and remain calm and act as naturally as possible. He's a good boy. A future paladin. Of that I have little doubt. I suspect the Fordring line will always be there to defend Lord Aron and his people. I certainly hope so. A short while later, Tyrion, Lord Commander Dathrahan, and several advisors from both parties had gathered in the council room. It was time for a brain trust meeting. I've received news that there are orcs in Hearthglen. What exactly is the current situation? A few days ago I had an encounter with an orc warrior. Though I wounded it badly, I was knocked out before I could slay the creature. I then returned to the spot where we battled to determine if the creature still lived, and to discern if there were others of its kind within my borders. My findings led me to believe that it was an isolated incident, and that there were no other orcs accompanying it. Tyrion ended his report there, knowing full well he was on dangerous ground. He had no wish to lie to his superior. Honour forbade it. You conducted your investigation alone? Yes, my lord. That's unfortunate. It would have helped to have someone who could corroborate your findings, Tyrion. Apparently your retainers don't share your optimistic appraisal of the situation. Tyrion noted Dathrahan glance past him towards someone at the back of the room, and he didn't need to turn around to know that someone was Bartholus, but the Lord Commander went ahead and confirmed it anyway. Paladin Bartholus sent word to me of the affair. He seems to believe that the threat to these lands is more dire than you do, so I've come to find out for myself. Zayden, we've been friends for years. Surely you don't doubt my judgement in this matter. I won't speak to young Bartholus' intentions. His zeal is commendable. But to worry you over such a minor matter is perplexing to say the least. Dathran then placed a hand on Tyrion's arm. Tyrion, I've always trusted your judgement. I've never questioned your honour. But certain events have transpired. Things that force me to look critically at any possible orcish incursions. The Lord Commander then leaned in. There's been reports of a new upstart war chief amongst the orcs. Apparently they're intent on rallying the clans and reforming the horde. But he's already managed to overrun a number of guarded camps. Alliance High Command have deemed this a state of emergency. So as you can see, my hands are tied. I'm sorry, old friend. I can't rely on your intuition alone. Well, shit. Tyrion tried to brace himself for what he knew was coming next. But first light will head out and scour the woodlands. Tyrion... You'll personally lead us to where you encountered the orc. If we find the creature, we'll take it back to Stratholm for interrogation. And there it was. No way out now. He'd been given a direct order. As you wish, my lord. The meeting then ended, with the vast bulk of the people in the council room exiting quickly and quietly. But as Tyrion turned towards the door, he saw young Bartholus, smirking like a prick. The following morning, Tyrion got up in a pretty foul mood. He'd barely slept a wink. A huge part of him and wanted nothing more than to go find Eitrig and warn him. Give the old orc the opportunity to evade capture. But if he'd done that, he'd be disobeying his superior's direct order. There was no possible way for him to uphold his vow to the orc and do his duty at the same time. Which kind of sucked. The party soon set off and rode for a few hours, with Tyrion leading the way. Until eventually, they arrived near the ruins of the old tower. This is where I first encountered the orc, my lord. Are you certain, Tyrion? 
seem rather pensive this morning. Yes, sir. I'm fine. Just a tad tired. Sir. The Lord Commander then motioned to his men to take up positions, and Tyrion shuddered as two guards started to set up a makeshift cage. Dathrahan then decided that stealth was the wisest approach, just in case there were multiple orcs in the area. A small group would approach the tower itself, and so off they went. However, as they reached the tower entrance, Bartholus went ahead and ruined any kind of element of surprise they might have had. We know you're here. Come out. Surrender yourselves, you foul beasts, or we'll be forced to kill you. There was a slight wobble to the young paladin's voice. Good, Tyrion thought. I hope he's shitting himself. But that slight sense of satisfaction soon ended, because a large silhouette then emerged from inside the tower. Eitrig. The orcs scanned the humans' faces with furious eyes, and then caught sight of Tyrion, and those furious eyes then changed to a look of absolute disgust, which caused Tyrion to feel just goddamn awful. The orc's expression then turned back to hate and fury. He definitely wasn't going to go down without a fight. We take it alive! However, either due to panic or sheer adrenaline, Bartholus then lunged forward on his own, and Eitrig blocked the young paladin's clumsy blow and punched him right in the face. Two footmen then rushed forward, slashing wildly, but again, Eitrig made short work of them. And so, Arden and the remaining guards attacked collectively, using their actual brains. And Tyrion could see that they were about to have a lot more success. Don't kill him! Everyone in the vicinity then stopped what they were doing, stared at Tyrion in disbelief. There was no two ways about it. His voice had held genuine concern for the orc's safety. Are you alright? As I already ordered, the beast is to be taken alive! The fighting then continued. Eitrig did well against his opponents, but, partly due to being outnumbered and partly due to his injured leg, he was eventually subdued, and Tyrion was just a whole roller coaster of emotions. Half of him wanted to jump in and defend Eitrig, but the other half couldn't possibly take up arms against his own fellows, so he was pretty much just stood there being a wreck the entire time. Bastard creature fought dishonourably. We should kill it right here, right now. Your wounded pride is not nearly as important as the information this creature may have. Restrain the beast. Several of the guards dragged the collapsed Eitrig and threw him into the makeshift cage. My lord, this old orc is no threat to anyone. What's gone into you, Tyrion? We literally just saw how much of a threat this orc is. Tyrion again turned his gaze back towards the beaten orc, and Eitrig, with his face swollen and dripping blood, stared straight back, with that same so much for your honour look in his eyes. A couple of the guards then started taking great pleasure in taunting and whipping the poor sod through the bars, and it was in that moment, finally, when something inside Tyrion just went ahead and snapped. He dashed forward, grabbed the whip out of the guard's hand, and then proceeded to lash the guy with it. How does it feel, huh? Tyrion, what are you doing? This orc must be set free. It's a matter of honour. Tyrion then started to smash at the lock of the cage, but the surrounding guards very quickly grabbed him and wrestled him to the ground. What in the light's name has come over you, Tyrion? Tell me you have some explanation. Tell me you didn't just try to free this creature. This orc saved my life, Satan. I vowed to let him live in peace, and by my honour I will fight to see that he does. Traitor! He's been consorting with his beast all along. Tyrion, I am trying very hard to be patient. Obviously you're confused. But regardless of what you believe happened, if you do not desist, I will be forced to have you arrested. So please, stop. Damn it, Satan. This is a matter of honour. Don't you understand that? I stand witness to his treachery, my lord. Shut up, Parthalus. Tyrion, you leave me no choice. I hereby charge you with treason against the Alliance. Captain Arden, see that the prisoner is bound and placed upon his horse. He'll be taken to Stratholme along with the Orc and placed on trial. Some time later, Tyrion was now in a small holding cell, awaiting his trial. He had no idea how the trial would go, what the verdict might be, or the sentence. All he knew for certain was that his life was about to change significantly. His family, his life of affluence and ease, all probably about to be taken away from him. What have I done? Footsteps then began echoing through the corridor, followed by the sounds of guards questioning the approaching someone, then the click of a latch, and then Arden entered the cell. It's good to see you. Have you been home since my arrest? Have you spoken with my wife? No. They won't allow me to leave until the trial is finished, my lord. I don't know if Karandra has been told. Or what of the orc? What did they do with him? Why do you care, Tyrion? It is your enemy. 
I don't understand why you're so concerned about it. There's no way it could have saved your life. It's a mindless brute. Just tell me, Arden. Please. Tyrion uttered those words as calmly as he could. Arden was probably the only friend he had left. Oh, they've been interrogating him for the past few nights. Though apparently it hasn't offered anything up they didn't already know. I heard some of the local guards boasting about how they'd beaten the crap out of him. They're going to hang the wretched beast tomorrow morning in the square. Tyrion's heart then sank. Itrig was going to die. And it was all his fault. But Arden seemed to note Tyrion's sadness. My lord, they might execute you for this. If you confess, claim that you lost your senses, maybe they'll relent and let you go. Surely this matter is not worth dying for. You're a paladin for light's sake. People depend on you. Why can't you just snap out of this? I can't, Arden. It's a matter of honor. I swore to protect the orc and I betrayed that vow. Whatever punishment they charge me with, it's well deserved. Ah, oh, this makes no sense, Tyrion. Think about your wife. Your child. I am, old friend. What kind of example would I set for my son if my word counted for nothing? What kind of man would I be seen as then? Arden turned away, bristling. It's not that simple and you know it. Just admit you made a mistake. I don't even know why we need to discuss this. It's like you've gone mental. A guard then stepped into the cell, interrupting that emotional moment. You'll have to leave now, Captain. We need to take the prisoner to the hall. Arden then gave Tyrion one last pleading look, and then buggered off. Tyrion straightened attempting to look as proud and confident as he could. I'm ready. About an hour later, Defenders of Lord Duran, today we stand in judgement of one of our own. The trial of Lord Tyrion Fordring will now commence. It was in this moment that Tyrion realised he was starting to sweat a little bit. Every major trial in Lord Duran was presided by four of the highest ranking lords within the Alliance, and one of them was now making his way onto the stage. All hail Lord Admiral Dalen Proudmore of Carl Tyrus. The Master of the Alliance Navies and Hero of the Second War walked proudly towards one of the thrones and took his seat. All hail Archmage Antonidas of the Majocracy of Dalaran. The second juror strode onto the stage in his big fabulous gown. All hail Alonzo's Fowl, Archbishop of the Church of the Holy Light. There was a third juror. And all hail Arthas Menethil, Crown Prince of Lordaeron and Paladin of the Silver Hand. A much beloved figure around these parts, and by these parts, I mean Strathol. Tyrion watched as the young prince took his place on the stage. The youth seemed to radiate goodness and wisdom, seemed like a nice young man. But that was all the jurors, so the paladin then motioned for everyone to rise. It was time for the judge to enter, and soon enough, Uther the Lightbringer then entered the Hall of Justice and took his place centre stage the sight of which caused Tyrion's mind to reel. Up until this point, he'd felt somewhat content with his actions. He would accept his fate, but looking up at the stern face of Uther caused his courage to waver a little bit. Perhaps Arden was right. Maybe he should beg for the court's mercy and forget the vow he made. Lord Paladin Fordring, you're charged with treason against the Alliance and failing to obey a direct order given to you by your superior. The noble lords gathered here will hear your case judge you accordingly under the light. How do you plead to the charges against you? I'm guilty as charged, my lord. I accept full responsibility for my actions. Oh, oh goodness gracious. Silence. Very well. Let the record show that Lord Paladin Fordring has entered a plea of guilty. The four jurors conversed amongst themselves for a brief moment before Lord Proudmore motioned for Uther to continue. Lord Commander saved in Dathrahan. Please come forward and give your testimony. Dathrahan then entered the stage, stopping and standing solemnly for a moment. He looked kind of sad, man. Lord Dathrahan, you've charged this man with treason. Please explain for the court the occurrence and the nature of this man's infraction. <clears throat> My lords, I do wish to state for the record that Tyrion Fordring has always been a man of honour and nobility, but I cannot deny what I saw with my own eyes. I led a detachment into the Hearth Glen Woods in search of renegade orcs. Lord Fordring assisted me with the exercise and helped to locate the orc that we now hold in our prison. But when I gave the order to arrest the creature, Lord Fordring turned on my men 
and attempted to free it. I asked him repeatedly to desist, but he would not relent. It is with a heavy heart that I give this testimony. Is there anyone here who can give credence to Lord Commander Dathrahan's testimony? I can, my lord. Tyrion's whole body clenched at the sound of Bartholus's annoying twatty voice. I was there, under Lord Dathrahan's command, when the incident took place. I bore witness to Tyrion's treachery firsthand. Uther then dismissed Dathrahan and motioned for Bartholus to take the stand, but as the two passed each other, Dathrahan gave the young paladin a very unsubtle glare. Apparently, Bartholus's attempts to brown nose his way to the top weren't exactly working. Good. State your claim, Junior Paladin Bartholus. The way in which Uther emphasised the word Junior suggested he too was not overly impressed by the little knob. Just as Commander Dathrahan said, my lord, I saw Lord Fordrin fight to save the orc from capture. He said he'd made a pact with the creature and would be damned if we incarcerated it. See, I knew it was up to something. Just had a feeling, you know? Bartholus. Yes, my lord. Shut your mouth. What? I've known this man for years. Saved each other's lives more than once. Stood before the enemy more times than I can remember. Whatever he may have done, he certainly deserves more than to be harangued by an unseasoned boy like yourself. At that, Bartholus turned white as a sheep. Your testimony's been heard and will be reviewed by the court. You're dismissed. Bartholus returned to his seat, obviously very embarrassed by what had just happened, and the four jurors then deliberated for a bit, before again motioning Uther to continue. Lord Paladin Fordry, do you have anything to say in your defence? So, Tyrion took to his feet. My lords, I know that this notion will sound preposterous, but the orcs saved my life. In return, I gave him my word as a paladin that I would protect him as well. His name is Eitrick and he's as honourable an opponent as I have ever faced. Oh! oh! Oh my god! You must understand me when I tell you. To follow my orders, I had to betray my honour as a paladin, and that is something I could not do. But that being said, I will accept whatever punishment you deem fit. Uther then turned to the four jurors, and for a moment it looked like he was arguing with them. But they then looked as if they accepted whatever it was he was saying to them, and Uther turned back towards the court. Lord Paladin Fordry, this court is well aware of your years of service in defence of Lord Ron and his allied kingdoms. Every man here is aware of your courage and valour. However, consorting with the sworn enemies of humanity, regardless of their supposed honour, is a grievous crime. In granting the Orc amnesty, you took a terrible risk, gambled the safety of Hearthglen on a personal whim. In light of your service, this court is prepared to offer you a full pardon, but only if you disavow your oath to the creature and reaffirm your commitment to the Alliance. Tyrion cleared his throat. Was it that easy? All he had to do was give in, and he could go home to his wife and child. Please, my lord, commit to them and be done with it. Let's put this nonsense behind us, Tyrion. Well, Tyrion, what's your answer? What is to be done with the Orc, my lord? It'll be executed. It's a savage murdering beast that cannot be allowed to live. Tyrion bowed his head and thought for a moment, with the image of Talon flashing in his mind. I will remain committed to the Alliance until my dying day. Of that have no doubt. But I cannot disavow the oath I took. To do so would betray everything I am. Everything we, as honourable men, hold dear. Oh! Goodness gracious! <sighs> so be it. Tyrion Fordring, from this day forth you are no longer welcome among the Knights of the Silver Hand. You are no longer fit to bask in the grace of the light. I hereby excommunicate you from our ranks. Oh! Without another word, Uther raised a hand and made a sweeping motion, and Tyrion suddenly felt a dark shadow pass over him, and that was followed by absolute despair and hopelessness. Your personal titles and holdings will be stripped from you, and shall be exiled from these kingdoms and live out the rest of your days among the wild things of this world. May the light have mercy on your soul. Tyrion was now in a complete daze, because he'd just lost absolutely everything. Though it goes against my better judgement, it is the will of this court that Paladin Bartholus take over as Regent Governor of Hearthglen, effective immediately. He will remain here to oversee the morning's hanging, and then return home to his duties. 
The exile, Tyrion Fordring, is to be escorted back to Marden Old Keep. There he'll collect his family and be escorted to the borders of Alliance Lands. These proceedings are over. Uther then gave Tyrion one last glance, with a look on his face that suggested he was actually quite disgusted by the trial's outcome. One last question, my lord. Uther paused and then nodded as a final gesture of respect and friendship. My wife and son. Will my sin damn their lives as it has mine? No, Tyrion. They may remain in Lordaeron if they so desire. This was your crime, not theirs. It took until nightfall for Tyrion and his escort to arrive back in Mardenhold Keep, and it had pissed it down with rain the entire journey. So the whole group was pretty tired and in sour moods. But as Arden turned to look at Tyrion and saw his former lord slumped over his saddle with drooped shoulders and his head bowed in despair, he realised that he probably didn't have it quite so bad. Although, seeing his former lord in such a state was pretty heartbreaking. Some of Tyrion's advisors then started to gather at the main gate, so Arden rode up to them. What's wrong with the lord? There's been some changes. What do you mean, Captain? Where have you both been these past few days? Our lord Tyrion has been found guilty of treason against the Alliance. A high court has ordered that he be exiled. What? Surely you must be mistaken. The advisor stared Arden right in his eyes and immediately realised that he was not, in fact, mistaken. It can't be. Well, who is our lord now, Arden? Who will rule over Hearthglen? At that, Arden shook his head and scoffed to himself. Bartholus will be our new lord. For the time being. At that revelation, the advisors also looked pretty disappointed and annoyed. I want the guards to stay on alert tonight. Tyrion is to remain here under house arrest. The first light, I'll take a party of footmen and escort him to the border. Until then, neither of us are to be disturbed. Is that clear? The advisors nodded and then watched with sadness in their eyes as Captain Arden returned to Tyrion's horse, grabbed the bloke and ushered him inside. Thanks for the help, Arden. This has been difficult. I just want you to know that you've been a good friend to me. I'm sorry for all of this. If there's anything you need, let me know. And with that, the captain buggered off, leaving Tyrion alone outside the door to his private chambers. He was shaking, overcome with emotion and a gnawing emptiness in his gut. He really did not want to face his wife and tell her what he'd done. It was ironic, really. After all the years he'd refused to lie to her, he now found he couldn't bear to tell her the truth. But he couldn't just stand out here in the corridor the entire night. It was time to be a man. So he pushed the door open and stepped inside. Tyrion, what happened? Where have you been? I accompanied Lord Dathrahan back to Strathholm. Well, thanks for letting us know. You really need to stop sneaking off, darling. If I didn't know you any better, I'd start suspecting you were seeking comfort with another woman. There was a teasing tone to Carandra's voice. She knew his honour was so important that he'd never do such a thing. But as she examined her husband and saw the super serious dead look in his eyes, she straightened. What's wrong? Is the boy asleep? Carandra frowned and nodded. Now she was definitely concerned. I don't quite know how to tell you this, my love, but I've been branded a traitor and stripped of my titles. Grandra's eyes widened in shock, so that's why he looked so defeated and deflated. She'd never seen him look this way before, and it frightened her immensely. So much so that she went from shock to denial pretty quickly and started shaking her head. No. 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 Do you remember the secret I kept from you? The orc I fought? He saved my life, Grandra. If it wasn't for him, I would have been crushed by a collapsing tower. To repay him, I vowed on my honour to keep his existence secret. Grandra continued shaking her head. She didn't want to hear any of this, but Tyrion carried on anyway. I was forced to hunt the orc down under direct orders, but when it came to capture him, my conscience overtook me. I fought to free him, to uphold my honour, and I was arrested on the spot. Tyrion finished, and the two of them stood in silence for quite a while until eventually, Carandra arrived at the anger stage of her grief. What were you thinking? Orcs are beasts, Tyrion. They have no concept of honour. You gambled all of our lives on a stupid, silly whim. Tyrion said nothing in response, simply stood there with his head bowed in defeat, the sight of which only really made Carandra more furious. What happens to us now, Tyrion? Did you even consider that whilst you were playing the martyr? I've been exiled, Carandra. I'm to be escorted to the border at first light. Exiled. Light damn you, Tyrion. 
I told you your precious honor would be the end of us. Without honor, everything we have is meaningless. Grandra went ahead and waved that nonsense away dismissively. Will your honor keep us fed? Keep our son decently clothed? How can you maintain this senseless obsession in the face of what's happened? What happened to the responsible man I married? I've always been this way, Karandra. Don't talk to me as if it's any surprise. You knew marrying a paladin would demand certain sacrifices. Sacrifices? I held my tongue every time you rode off to battle. I sat here alone for countless hours, unsure if you were dead or alive. Do you have any idea what that was like? I never complained once. All those times you left us for your duties. I knew you had a job to do, had people counting on you. But I counted on you too, damn it. I know all about sacrifices, Tyrion. But this time, the price is too high. Tyrion already knew the answer to his next question, but he went ahead and asked it anyway. What do you mean? I love you, Tyrion. But I won't be coming with you. And neither will Talon. I will not have our son grow up as an outcast. Or be subject to ridicule for the rest of his life. He doesn't deserve that. And neither do I. It was at that moment that Tyrion felt like his life now basically had zero meaning whatsoever. Losing the light was devastating enough, but losing his family... I understand, Karandra. Are you certain this is what you want? You've ruined your life. I will not hold on while you plummet to the bottom and ruin ours as well. I hope your precious honor keeps you warm at night. Karandra, wait. However, Karandra did not wait. She buggered off, slamming a door behind her and locking it. Tyrion then spent the next long while just kind of staring into space. His head was all over the place. However, in that daze, the former paladin then found himself walking towards his reading room, sitting down at his desk, grabbing a piece of parchment ink and a quill, and scribbling down a whole bunch of thoughts. Several hours later, Tyrion put the quill down. He'd finished his letter. It was now only about an hour before sunrise. So he got up from his desk and walked to his son's room. The boy was still fast asleep, snuggled in his little blanket, doing a cute high-pitched snore thing through his stupid little nostrils. With a shaky hand, Tyrion reached into his pocket and retrieved the letter he'd just spent hours writing and put it in a secret safe place. Perhaps someday the boy might understand what I've done, he thought. Goodbye, my son. However, just as he saddled Mirador, This is the second time I've caught you trying to sneak off, Tyrion. I figured you'd try something like this. Are you here to stop me, Arden? Even if I had a mind to, I doubt I could. I sat up all night thinking about what you said at the trial. I think perhaps I understand. You were only doing what you believed to be right. I can't condemn you for that. I need to ask you a favor, old friend. It's the most important thing I've ever asked of you. Whatever is in my power to do, I will do. Watch over them for me, Arden. Keep my wife and boy safe. I will. Tyrion arrived back at the outskirts of Strathholm in good time, tethered his horse in the woods, and was now running the last quarter of a mile to the city. And whilst he was running, he was hoping to formulate some kind of plan to save old Eitri. However, he wasn't having much luck. No brilliant plan was springing to mind. The problem was, he didn't particularly want to end up killing or injuring his own people. But, he was a convicted traitor, so they'd have absolutely no issue killing or injuring him. The fact was, the chances of him saving the orc and escaping Strathholm alive were pretty slim, really. But that wasn't going to stop him. What did he have to lose? Tyrion finally reached the city and entered its streets. There were a few merchants and vendors beginning to set up their wares for the day, but it was still early, so the streets were pretty empty. However, as he neared the public square, he began to hear loud voices, shouting and jeering. And as he entered said square, he saw a large gathering at the centre, all here to see the spectacle of an orc's hanging. But luckily for Tyrion, the prisoner had not yet been brought out. Good. It wasn't too late. The gathering then started to stir even louder as a newcomer stepped up to the gallows, and Tyrion grimaced as he saw it was Bartholus. Another figure then stepped up onto the stage, Lord Dathrahan. It wasn't long now, Tyrion thought. They'll likely bring the orc out very soon. And sure enough, after a tense few minutes, some nearby gates began to open, and a squad of footmen strode out, dragging a huddled shape. Tyrion's heart then sank in his chest. He didn't stand a chance here. He had no plan. He was massively outnumbered. He had no weapon. Eitrig was very much about to die. Through sheer panic, Tyrion started to move forward, entering the crowd and pushing his way through. 
They were so excited, nobody even noticed the very recently exiled Lord passing. But as Tyrion made his way to the front, he noticed Lord Datherhan give a swift salute and then exit the stage. Apparently that guy had no interest in watching the upcoming execution. Bartholus, however, was smiling broadly and eager to get things going. He nodded to the hangman, who proceeded to place the noose around the orc's throat, whilst Bartholus waved his hand in the air once more and motioned for silence. My fellow defenders of Lordaeron, I'm glad to see so many of you turned out this morning. This loathsome creature that stands before you is an affront to the light and an enemy of our people. Its cursed race brought war and suffering to our shores, murdered many of our loved ones with little or no remorse. Thus, we will extinguish this wretched creature's life just as remorselessly. Blood for blood. Debt for debt. The crowd cheered wildly, screaming for the orc's blood, and their overwhelming smothering hatred caused Tyrion to feel quite sick. Since when had his own people been so vile and savage? The hangman then moved Eitrig into position, over a trapdoor, and for the first time, the orc's stoic mask kind of slipped a little bit. He started shaking and fighting against his restraints, and the crowd just laughed. And if that wasn't enough to tip Tyrion over the edge, the fact that the hangman was now reaching his hand in slow motion towards the trapdoor's lever certainly was. Tyrion surged forward, exiting the front of the crowd, grabbed a conveniently placed sledgehammer that was just lying around on the ground for some reason and made his presence known. The former paladin struck fast and hard, taking out a whole bunch of guards. He had butted the shit out of Bartholus before he could even react, and bloody suplexed the hangman for good measure. Even over the raging shocked crowd, Tyrion could hear the rushing footsteps of more guards on the way, so he quickly raced over to Eitrig and started to untie the noose. Human? Yes, Eitrig. It's me. <laughs> You're crazy. However, you've damned yourself this day, traitor. Tyrion turned to see not only Bartholus had picked himself up off the ground, but Lord Dathrahan had reappeared and was now looming as well, his face a mask of grief and revulsion. Seize them. Some knights stepped forward, as commanded, but Tyrion stretched out his hand. He'd spent his entire life leading men into battle. It was time to use his big strong boy voice. Hear me. This orc has done you no harm. He is old and infirm. His death would accomplish nothing. The knights stopped and all looked at each other, a little bit perplexed by what that had to do with anything. It's an orc. We're at war with its kind. What's your point? We may very well be, but this one's warlike days are over. There's no honor in hanging such a defenseless creature. You're not fit to speak of honour, Tyrion. You're a traitorous mongrel. Those words hit Tyrion like a slap in the face. I took a vow, long ago, to protect the weak and defenceless, and I intend to do just that. You see, boy, that's what it truly means to be a paladin, knowing the difference between right and wrong, being able to separate justice from vengeance. You've never been able to make those distinctions, have you, Bartholus? At that, Bartholus nearly choked with rage. How dare Tyrion say such a thing? The sound of a single beating drum then started to boom out above the din of the crowd, causing Eitrig to suddenly perk up a little bit. The orc was now seemingly scanning his surroundings, as if looking for some familiar sight, which Tyrion thought was a bit weird, but Bartholus didn't really seem to have noticed. Have you forgotten, Tyrion? You're no longer a paladin. You're a disgrace. An exile. It doesn't matter what you think or believe. Damn it, Bartholus, open your eyes. After all these years I ruled over Hearthglen, the one thing I'm absolutely certain of is that war begets only war. If we can't master our own hatreds, this conflict will never cease. There will never be a future for our people. Bartholus then laughed contemptuously in Tyrion's face, whilst the drumbeat grew louder, now joined by other drums. It was loud enough now that everyone was hearing it, and they were all getting a bit startled. But Bartholus just carried on as if it was perfectly normal. The future of our people is no longer your concern. I rule Hearthglen now, Tyrion. And as long as I do, I swear there will never be peace with the orcs. On my parents' departed souls, I swear that every last orc in Lordaeron will burn for what they've done. It was in that moment that Tyrion finally realised there was no reasoning with this guy. He'd given over completely to his rage and grief. But all of that aside, what the bloody hell was the drumming all about? Kill the orc! Kill them but- no! As blood splattered right across Tyrion's face, he stared, stunned, as Bartholus slumped to the ground, with an orcish spear sticking out of him. And then, all hell broke loose within the crowd. 
you brought this down upon us. I always knew you'd betray. Tyrion didn't give a shit what Marthos was muttering. He immediately snapped to attention, grabbing Eitrig and hauling him away from the gallows. He had no idea how the orcs had made their way through the city's outer defences, but he was certainly going to use this chaos to his advantage. And it was indeed chaos. All around him was a killing ground, with mighty orc warriors hacking their enemies to pieces. A short while later, after a supreme amount of effort, Tyrion had managed to haul Eitrig all the way out of the city and into some nearby woods. He could still hear screams and clashing weapons in the distance, and part of him felt extremely sad about it, but the other part felt kind of relieved. Thanks to the orc's sudden attack, he'd managed to save Eitrig. However, he then realised Eitrig was being very silent on the ground, so he knelt down to check for a pulse, and gasped in panic when he couldn't feel one. So, he placed his hands on Eitrig's chest, and started to pray to the light. But a feeling of dread then started to fill the former paladin, because nothing was happening. Shit, he'd been excommunicated from the light, he remembered. No, you will not die, Eitrig. Do you hear me? I won't have it. Tyrion then started to concentrate really hard. So hard he risked having an aneurysm. By the grace of the light, may your brethren be healed. In its grace, he will be made anew. Tyrion was convinced that the light could not truly be taken from him. Sure, they could strip him of his armor, his titles, his home, family and wealth. But the light would always be within him. And sure enough, the searing warmth started to fill his heart with a glow emanating from his hands, and he almost cried when said glow engulfed the orc's ravaged body. Eitrig's visible wounds started to heal, and he gasped for air as his eyes burst open. <sighs> Human? What's happened? How did we get here? We're outside the city, Eitrig. We're safe for the time being. The orc coughed and eased himself to a sitting position, but the strain of the past few days proved a little bit too much for his old body, so he fell back down and passed out. And then, a rustling sound. Tyrion looked around frantically, and braced himself for danger, whilst a whole bunch of muscly green blokes emerged from the trees. This isn't what it looks like. A larger orc started to walk towards him. Tyrion gulped, but the large orc simply knelt down beside Eitrig, placed a hand on the old orc's forehead, concentrated, and somehow brought him back to consciousness. You are Eitrig of the Blackrock clan, are you not? Bloody hell. Do all orcs speak properly? Tyrion thought. It's taken me a long time to track you down, old one. Your face is familiar to me, Wari. You're far too young to be. Who are you? I am known as Thrall, old one. I'm war chief of the ward. Tyrion blinked. This was obviously the upstart that Dathrahan had spoken of. I've heard of you. And what exactly have you heard, human? That you plan to rebuild the horde and renew your war against my people. <laughs> you are partially correct. I am rebuilding the Horde. My people will not remain in chains for long. But I have no interest in making war for war's sake. Those dark days are over. Over? I just watched as you and your warriors hacked your way through Stratholm. You presume much, human. We only attacked the city to reclaim one of our own. Times have changed. Your kingdoms mean nothing to me. I only seek to finish my father's work and find a new homeland for my people. Your father's work? Eitrig's eyes then widened in excitement. I knew I recognized you. You're the son of Joradan. Thrall nodded, and Eitrig looked as if he was beside himself with joy. I'll follow you, son of Joradan. I will help heal our people in any way that I can. Eitrig told me of your father and of his fate. He must have been a great hero to elicit such devotion from his son. My people have always held that it is his son's duty to finish his father's work. Tyrion nodded, wondering if Talon would ever share that sentiment. Probably not. What boy would ever be proud of having a disgraced exile as a father? Thor then motioned to Eitrig and yelled a few short guttural commands in the orcish tongue. Tyrion found himself getting a little bit nervous again. What was going to happen now? Were they going to let Tyrion go? Or were they going to kill him? But Thrall simply smirked, almost knowingly. You risked your life to save our brother, human. We have no quarrel with you. You're free to go, so long as you don't follow us. And Tyrion sighed in relief. Thank the light for that. However, before the chapter ends, a strong hand then grabbed Tyrion by the arm, and he looked down to see it was Eitrix. We are both bound by blood and honor, brother. 
I will not forget you. Fifteen years later or something. Do you, Tail and Fordring, vow to uphold the honour and codes of the Order of the Silver Hand? I do. Do you vow to walk in the grace of the light and spread its wisdom to your fellow man? I do. Talon, who was now 20 years old apparently, was overcome with a whole bunch of emotions. He'd been waiting for this moment for as long as he could remember. Do you vow to vanquish evil wherever it be found, and protect the weak and innocent with your very life? By my honour I do. The Archbishop carried on with the ceremony, addressing the assembly and all of that shiz, but Talon had kind of zoned out a little bit. His attention was focused elsewhere. Very subtly, he reached into his pocket and took hold of a rolled, tattered parchment that he always carried with him. It was a note, left to him by his father before he was exiled. Would have been a bit awkward if he just pulled it out and read it right in this moment, but luckily for him, and for us, he'd memorised every single word of it. My dear Taylor, by the time you're old enough to read this, I'll have been gone a long time. I can't adequately express how painful it is to have to leave you and your mother behind, but I suppose sometimes life forces you to make difficult decisions. I fear that you'll no doubt hear many bad things about me as you grow older. People will look upon my actions and condemn them as evil. I fear that others will look down upon you for the decisions I've made. I won't try to explain everything that's happened in this note, but I need you to know that what I did, I did for honor's sake. Honor is an important part of what makes us men, Taylor. Our words and our deeds must count for something in this world. I know it's asking a great deal, but I hope that you'll understand that someday. I want you to know that I love you dearly, and that I'll always carry you close to my heart. Your life and your deeds will be my redemption, son. You are my pride and my hope. Be a good man. Be a hero. See ya. Talon then came out of his reverie, just in time to hear the Archbishop say, Arise, Talon Forgery, Paladin Defender of Lordaeron. Welcome. To the Order of the Silver Hand. The entire assembly erupted in cheers and claps, and beaming with pride, Talon turned and smiled warmly towards his mother, and towards an old family friend, Arden, who stood beside her. The next few minutes consisted of Talon being approached and congratulated by a whole bunch of people. Meanwhile, Arden turned to make his way towards the exit, and out the corner of his eye, he saw a somewhat familiar figure. The guy was hooded, well disguised, but Arden would have recognised him anywhere. Tyrion. The stranger glanced back and smiled knowingly, and then buggered off, slipping out the back of the cathedral. <laughs> like father, like son. <laughs>